It's my pleasure to introduce Poppy Crum. Poppy is a neuroscientist and technologist and the chief scientist at Dolby Laboratories and also an adjunct professor at Stanford University. I know, it's a lot of stuff. Poppy is going to speak with us about her work on the intersection of human experience, artificial intelligence, sensory data science, and immersive technologies. She innovates on the concept of empathetic technology, building technologies that engage psychology, physiology, and interaction with the world. We're asking her to turn that vision to the possibility of a thriving city. Welcome, Poppy. Thanks for having me be part of this. It's such an amazing event that you're putting on and, and so relevant and, and important in the world right now. The things that are that, that I'm, I, I guess, most passionate about, they are personalization and what I call contextual optimization. Technology or has been designed for either one size fits all. It assumes we all look the same, which is really prevalent in a lot of technology. I know we talk about bias in AI, but we have yeah. built bias in technology. That's what we're trying to break out of. But also it assumes that we never move. You know, a lot of technologies assume we're always sitting in the same place and that, you know, the context, our ambient, you know, what's happening in that space is not dynamic. And that completely affects our sensory capabilities in those rooms, in those environments. And even if the intent of an experience is being realized to every demographic and every individual, across, mm -hmm. every time it's touched. Um, a lot of work that, that we look at is, you know, includes proliferation of sensors in our spaces or on our bodies. Um, mm -hmm. The amount of information we can know about each other, know about our environments. How can that be reactive? Um, how can that be more intelligent? and gave us insight that makes our technology more um, dynamic to the intent of the user and the intent of uh, a successful application to the user. Um, also considerations, uh, you know, obviously that's paired with machine learning and, and artificial intelligence in different directions. Things like the dynamics of my eye, how the diameter of my pupil changes, 15 years ago, that used to be something that we would look at in labs and, and the, the devices to capture the same fidelity uh, maybe cost us $15,000, $20,000. Today, that's going to be, you know, that cut, we're on dollars, if not pennies, coming in the next few years as part of every, you know, smart um, pair of glasses that is, you know, produced and, and worn around the world. So suddenly you have these platforms where the channel of information you know about the user is very rich because the diameter of my eye is responding not just to lighting around me, but it's also responding to how hard my brain is having to work in a particular context. It's also responding to how engaged I am to a particular element or experience. And you start pairing that with other sensors in the environment and you have knowledge um, about me that's very unique and very contextually dependent and relevant where now I can start learning a lot more about the individual. Um, just in the di you know, chemical composition of our breath, uh, you can de detect emotion. You can detect how a individuals in a space, are, what kind of emotional and experiential journey they're going on through knowing the carbon dioxide levels in the room and how those have changed relative to certain contextual elements. When you start thinking about the amalgamation of these sensors, it becomes very uh, powerful to consider what, what a dynamic space would be that is actually serving the user and is really um, what I like to call empathetic to the intent of the individual. Uh, one example I often give is, look, you know, <laughs> even the smartest thermostat on, you know, on the market today or in development, really, it doesn't even know if I'm hot or cold. I mean, it's like <gasps> failing. It's most critical thing. You know, it may, <laughs> my behaviors move way past, you know, we tell it what to do. And it's really trying to learn about me, but it doesn't know who I am. It doesn't know what I'm trying to do. And, you know, I may be uh, 115 pound you know, female, or I may be, you know, I may be a, a large male. I may be a woman who's going through menopause. I may be trying to stay up at night and finish a presentation. What's my cognitive intent, my cognitive capacity? How mm -hmm. can the information be serving me and serving my success in that environment so that I trust it? Because trust is a big part of it, you know, because it's not that the technology is empathizing with me or reading my emotions. It's about the technology is using tools to optimize and learn information about my internal state, my internal intent to make me more successful for my goals in that space. I, you know, I, I talk about personalization and it, you know, how a lot of technology right now uh, is built for one size fits all. You know, something even as simple as a headphone 
or you know, I'm sitting here with Beth and she's got uh, AirPods in. Right? <laughs> so to create the experience of sound around us, you know, algorithms have to take into account how sound interacts with the human body, how it bounces yeah. off our head, our torso, every ripple of our pinna. So often in technology, we it's been built to assume we all look the same, but one size fits all because that bespoke filter that we each have as we interact with uh, space and, and sounds is creating a very unique pattern of amplifications and attenuations that our brain yeah. is creating to date. Basically every technology assumes we're the same. So these are things that have changed. You know, in the last five years, we can use computer vision techniques. We can pair those with you know, machine learning with neural nets. And we're able to, in very rapid time, completely personalize based on an individual's more, you know, morphology, basically the shapes of our bodies and even our internal biological composition, personalize the experience so that the intent of that technology and the intent of any experiences delivered over it are really about each of us. Because it's not just, you know, as, as a female, I am different than a male, but even within any demographic, whether it's um, ethnicity or it's sex, we are very unique. So the answer is really, where do we, how we identify that and build for everyone. And the capability and, I mean, that we have today is really completely changed. So it's, we have to make that commitment to identify where these instances exist and not build for one group, but build across all the populations. That is super amazing. And it also, is, I think, makes clear why ML and AI are central to the work that you're doing in terms of the, the capacity and potential of absolute customization. Um, so I wanted to um, ask you a little bit about trust, because I, my intuition is your argument about customization. No and how we build to, uh, from individual to community to city, trust will be important there. Trust and transparency in algorithms is necessary. Trust and transparency in how data is being captured and how it's being used is also critical. A lot of things I talk about require a lot of individual and personal data to make them actually work for each other. I, I sometimes say, look, you know, you, you almost have to embrace your inner minority report a little bit and look at that, you know, minority report 1984. There are these brilliant cautionary tales of how yeah. the world go awry when we, when we fail at, you know, in certain, er certain ways, but there are mm -hmm. elements of those that help us design to, to, to prevent those mistakes if we mm -hmm. wisely and ethically, but yeah. at the same time, there's a lot of freedoms that come with um, the, the power of this personal data. Because without yeah. it, you know, we really are building a lot of technology that's going to work for some people and not work for others. And it's going yeah. to elevate some people and not elevate others. And it's going, I mean, and, you know, every stage of development in AI can introduce bias. But right now we have bias in technology. It, it's not that we don't have, we have to worry about every one of these pillars and how we build training sets, how we evaluate them, how we audit yeah. them. Constant vigilance is not going to go away. Right. But we have to also recognize that, look, I, I think a lot of the world does not think about how biased our technology is. And that's not, you know, it's whether it's sex or ethnicity or, or race or, or, but age too. Trust in the technology also come, I, I'm a big believer in transparency. Uh, the amount of information that is captured in different areas is, is not always transparent. And that's what's broken in so many places. One example that I think is really powerful. There's a lot of effort going on right now in the technology space to amplify what's called aging in place. That's the idea that, you know, someone who is an elder is able, or as you age, you're able to stay autonomous in your own environment, your own home for a much longer period of time, uh, potentially, you know, 10 or 15 years more than you otherwise might have been where you would have to be in a, you know, care facility or, you know, with a, you know, within another, your family, if that's an option. This has major implications on individuals' autonomy, their savings financially, but it also has major health implications as we've, as we've seen in the last, uh, unfortunately, last, the last few months. And when we think about cities, so aging in place is the idea that I have, you know, a lot of sensors in my environment, a lot of ways of knowing, you know, when I amalgamate those with, you know, intelligent machine learning and, and such, I'm able to now have a much richer 
understanding of the success of that individual, the quality of life for them, not just whether they are taking their pills, but also their yeah. um, emotional and mental capacity and need in that environment. Obviously, we're seeing, you know, you're tracking of heart rate through Wi-Fi, but also you're seeing emotions and ways of intervening and ways of knowing where the human connection is really relevant, but also by building that link, by building that connection to the caregivers, you are enabling someone a lot of freedoms. And it's through that amalgamated, you know, intelligence in their spaces that they gain so much capacity and freedom that we now, you know, we know improves them mentally, physically, and, you know, from a health perspective, gives them a lot more protection of risk from risk in different areas. So that's a really strong example of how a thriving city, what we might be designing toward. And if I'm hearing you right, I'm hearing there a whole arc where we go from individual to community to city. Absolutely. I'm, I am talking about, you know, a place where I know the, where the individual opportunity is quite substantial, you know, you, it, it, namely because you have, a, you have a group that has a need that is really underserved and it, get, it gets them a great deal of freedom. It provides a great deal of freedom. Moving to, you know, what does that mean, you know, for the, the city? When you have, start to have intelligent spaces that are dynamic, empathetic with me, that are... Mm-hmm. Um, trusted because it's it's critical and we're not talking about her you know we're not talking about like you know it's a trust that this environment will be optimized for me to to elevate me when you walk into then the work workspace it's a different question because that's also a broken environment i walk into the same room and when we need new rooms when we need new spaces we build new footprints so how can we think about that optimization the ways that a room so in the case of aging in place i'm using that amalgamated sensing that network of uh you know information about me in my environment to enable me to be autonomous, to be more connected in the workplace, that suddenly becomes, how do I like optimize my uh, intent, my goals of a team in this, in an environment that could become modular and not modular in this move a cable around, but modular in the sense of, you know, I'm dynamically changing, you know, the sounds, the lights, the context, the skins of that space so that it now is serving a different purpose for that group, but very dynamically. Uh, So, the question I have that's specific to what we're doing with Thriving Cities and Audacity is where are there some gaps in either opportunity or vision that you can work in a different type of way than the, than the context you're in? The, the intelligence that becomes a dynamic space is something I think about a lot, but that's a very big topic. And it, to me, it's a critical part of uh a future city that is serving us and working with us, you know, and supporting who we want to become, not who we are, but who we want to become, how we move ourselves in those positive directions and that we all see. It's, it's one thing to be doing pieces of that and thinking about the applications or for, you know, or a user group that's very much in need, such as aging in place. That being said, it's about building that trust and uh, environment into how we design and how we conceptualize where and and change our mental representation of what a space is for mm-hmm. you know each and every one of us within different cultures and different contexts and and that's a really big topic i i don't think there's another group that's put together the type of you know a diverse set of perspectives that that can take such a thing on so i i really hope you you think about that and continue to and i'd love to be part of it so um there's a, a film that came out and it's called The Sound of Silence. I, I definitely thought about it with your, with your effort. So you and the two filmmakers actually uh, consulted with me in the, for the film. And, and I, I was serving two roles. I was like making sure when they talked about music that it was a you know, fairly accurate representation. But it was also because the main character, as unique as he is, shares a certain commonalities to the way I experience the world. Number one, so I have absolute pitch. Every sound I hear... In whether it's a refrigerator, whether it's the sound of an HVAC system, whether it's the sound of uh, too much noise in uh, the environment, um, I, I assign, ascribe a pitch to it, a note name, and it also has a really visceral interaction on me. I also am a little bit of, I like to say a gremlin. Like if, you know, I have a very reactive um, vagal nerve response to bright lights. If you shine them on me, I will feel it viscerally. It's part of 
my own rich experience with senses that has caused me to study them. And so, you know, and understand the impact they have on me that whenever they have positive or negative impacts on me, I, I want to make sure that um, other people are, have the same sort of control and understanding in their environments to be successful, where I've been able to modulate my own environment to make sure that I know what affects me in these different ways, but that's, you know, what I, what I care about. And I, I want that for everyone. The thing, so this film is all about Peter Sarsgaard. He walks into rooms and listens to the sound of them. So he'll, and, and tries to solve uh, the problems in people's lives, their relationship problems, their problems at work solely through the sounds in their living room. And he'll walk in and he'll hear, you know, the radiator and say, that's a B flat and your teapot is going off at this, you know, and that's creating discordance in your life. The, the funny thing is as, as much as that is meant to be, you know, it's fictional, there's reality in it, not just for me, but for other individuals, for everyone. The reality is, is that we move in different ways. Our environments cause us to make sense, to, to interact in them in different ways that ultimately does impact our brains when we walk into different contexts, when we walk into different environments. Every time we engage in a different space, we're creating contextual cues that can influence how our senses, how our sensitivities, how our attention is modulated, how it's optimized. And when you start thinking about that on a city scale, it's a very real thing that you know, we create our environments, our environments are changing us, it becomes a cycle. Everything we do in different spaces is affecting you know, how our brain is allocating resources. Whether I grew up in a village in Afghanistan or a town in the Midwest or New York or Kathmandu or any different environment, the, the context of color, contour, sounds in my environment shapes how my brain is gonna allocate resources to allow me to be successful in that space, in that, you know, whether it's rural, whether it's urban, even the colors and dynamics of a different different neighborhoods in New York City or in Manhattan, um, you know, it, it alters us in ways that we often don't realize. But it's those unique adaptations that our brain is making to allow us to be effective and in our environments are things that we can be cognizant, we can be um, aware of. And it's part of how we can shape a city and think about what is that dynamic neuroplasticity of the environment and how is it going to shape us in different ways. So I can look at hearing thresholds across the world and know what city someone's in. Uh, suddenly you're in a place where you start thinking about, okay, these are the things that make us successful in these environments. And are these good? Are these bad? How are these limiting us? or affecting us in deleterious ways or in positive ways? And how do we design from a sensory augmentation, sensory capacity, neuroplasticity perspective? I have personally experienced my world changing and I, have, I think there's a lot of opportunity if we think that way to, in, you know, to have empathy and uh, bring together a lot of diverse perspectives and great human capability. You just set my day off in a terrific direction. I'm just like, oh, now I'm going to get to think about all these things. Poppy, thank you so much. Our next...